in psychology at Howard University. <clears throat> he earned his PhD in the same field from Temple in 2002. He is president and CEO of the Quality Education for Minorities Network, which helps um, build capacity and provide technical assistance to HBCUs and other minority serving institutions. He's editor in chief of the Journal of Negro Education, which is the oldest continuously published referee journal by and about black people. He's the executive editor and editor in chief of the Journal of the Center for Policy Analysis and Research, which publishes original research and analysis on public policy issues related to black politics. From 2013 to 2016, he was the executive director of the White House Initiative on Historically Black Colleges and Universities, uh, which was appointed by President Obama to devise strategies to sustain and expand federal support to HBCUs. He's published six books and edited volumes, the most recent in 2019 entitled No BS or Bad Stats, Black People Need People Who Believe in Black People Enough Not to Believe Every Bad Thing They Hear About Black People, which among other uh, virtuous things featured analysis of um, some IPMS data. He has several dozen peer reviewed articles and several dozen book chapters, monographs and policy reports. His opinion pieces and letters have appeared in places like the New York Times, the Washington Post, the Chronicle of Higher Education. Uh, I could probably spend the last uh, 53 minutes of the seminar time continuing to extol his virtues, but I should probably let him talk. Thank you very much, Ivory, for uh, visiting today. Your payment, which is a, um, an, uh, a Center Series mug, will be in the mail. I think St Stacy's on that. Um, I, I will turn the floor over to you. Okay. Thank you so much, Rob, and uh, great meeting you earlier. Uh, and it's, it's great to be here. Uh, I, I started analyzing IPUMS data. Uh, I was calling it IPUMS uh, until today, uh, but I started analyzing IPUMS data around 2008. Uh, it, it started when I did a, a training at the University of Michigan uh, at a center called the National Poverty Center. And, uh, and I have to say that when I was a child, I always dreamed of having a, a magic box. And this is a true story. Uh, I dreamed of having a magic box uh, and I could uh, ask the box anything I wanted and it could give me uh, the answers to it. And I could answer it, I could ask it all types of random questions because I always had you know, all these random uh, questions in my head when I was a child. Uh, and when I learned how to analyze IPM's data, that was the closest thing I had to that box uh, where I could just uh, ask it all types of questions and, and, uh, and would get the answers. Uh, so when I was invited to, to speak uh, at the University of Minnesota uh, at the, the POP Center, uh, I was uh, you know, just really honored um, and, and humbled uh, because uh, uh, there's, there's so much that uh, I've gotten out of uh, having access to the type of resources that you all cultivate there. Uh, so, um, so, so this is a, a, a distinct pleasure for me. Uh, so today I'm going to talk about um, how to analyze data uh, in a way that honors the populations that you are uh, analyzing the data on. Uh, and that, uh, that I would hope you want to try to find information that, that, that helps to advance that particular population. Uh, it, it, it sounds like a pretty um, you know, simple and straightforward thing, but it's actually pretty complex because of some of the norms that's, that's in our field. Um, the, the way that this is structured, I, I think uh, on paper, I'm not, not sure uh, how much you all have been given in terms of the structure, but uh, what I was given on paper is that I would give a 45 minute lecture and you'd have about 15 minutes uh, for Q&A. Uh, I want to reduce the time that I'm actually lecturing because I, I really wanna get into more of a, a dialogue with you all. Uh, so I'm, I'm thinking that uh, I'm gonna speak for you know, about 20 minutes, maybe uh, a little bit more. Uh, and then I want to open it up for more of a robust conversation. So if you all can indulge me and, and uh, really think of some questions that'll uh, get the conversation going, uh, that would be great. Um, but I want to, and I also want this to be more conversational. Um, I don't really think of this as a as a lecture. I know that that the other people uh, on this this call right now uh, is comprised of a lot of academics like myself, peers, and and um, and advanced. Uh, doctoral students and some new doctoral students and, and other um, uh, graduate students and perhaps some, some undergrads. But uh, I want to stress that everyone has a, a, a meaningful, meaningful insight to contribute to this larger conversation. And a lot of things I'm going to be talking about today are things that we're really trying to figure out right now. 
uh, on how to do better. So I, I think um, all of you all have something valuable to contribute to this. So let me talk a little bit about how I got involved in uh, debunking what I started to call BS, or bad stats. Um, it started when I was doing research on uh, black males. Uh, it was around uh, 2005, 2006. Uh, I started working with the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation. At that time, there was a lot of articles that talked about the state of black males. Uh, they, they, they talked about it in terms of an achieve, uh, achievement gap. And there was a lot of concern and consternation about how black males were doing in various aspects of society, including education, uh, employment, and criminal justice. Uh, and a lot of what was appearing in the newspapers uh, was information uh, related to uh, how black males were doing in comparison to the other race groups, including uh, white men, uh, Asian and Hispanic. Uh, and so uh, a lot of what I was reading highlighted a lot of problems, but I didn't see a lot of uh, solutions embedded in that. Um, as I started to analyze various types of data sources. And so um, writing this report for the Congressional Black Caucus Foundation, uh, what I had in my mind was really very similar to what I had been exposed to, uh, looking at how black males were doing on a number of different indicators as compared to other races. But as I looked at some of these data sets, including health beh behaviors in school-aged children, the National Crime Victimization Survey, School Crime Supplement, uh, and a few other data sources from the, the, the National Center for Educational Statistics. Um, what I found was that I wasn't really uh, engaging in this problem finding uh, type of, of um, exercise really seemed incomplete to me. Uh, so I started to try to figure out, you know, what else could I do with this data to really understand the issue? And I found that the best way for me to really understand what's going on with black males is to analyze a range of different outcomes for black males. Uh, so specifically, I started looking at high achieving black males, middle achieving black males, and low achieving black males. And I started to create these trajectory uh, plots, these, these, mean, these mean plots uh, using MANOVA, uh, where I would look at uh, at, at academic success, and I will look at some external factor like um, uh, their their diet or their sleeping or the relationships they have with their parents, and I would look to see what were some of the things that helped us to predict whether or not they were doing well in school. And so I found that by analyzing Black males without comparing them to another race group, I was able to find out what separated high achieving black males from middle and low achieving black males, rather than looking at all black males compared to uh, um, all males in another race group. And so with that, I was able to find a lot more solutions in terms of, of um, uh, I looked at four categories of, of, um, of factors. Uh, one was personal emotional factors, another was um, 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 social and personal emotional factors, family factors, social environmental factors, and school-related factors. So those were the four factors that I looked at. So I was able to, I was able to find a lot of different um, uh, things that helped us to understand what separated high-achieving Black males from low-achieving Black males. Now, another thing that, that happened during that same time, and this is purely through happenstance, I was also uh, invited to be a judge of a writing contest for black males. The writing contest was called Model in My Shoes. Uh, an, an author from South Carolina started the writing contest and she wanted to, um, she wanted young black males to tell their own stories. So these were eighth grade and 10th grade black males that she invited to write about their own stories. And she had a prize that was associated with that. And she put forth all of the, the uh, funding for this project herself. So she asked me to review these essays and rate them. And as I was reading these essays and looking at my analysis, uh, there was a lot of things that really illuminated. So for instance, there was a finding that I had, um, and this was using health behaviors in school-aged children. 
and I wanted to look at uh, the, the the health indicators of our, our, our health habits and behaviors that might have been associated with Black males doing well in school. So I did a stepwise multiple regression analysis. Uh, that's where you uh, load all of these different um, uh, variables into the equation, and uh, through whatever software package you're you're using, they, there's an analysis that's done, and it kicks out the ones that don't have a relationship to your outcome uh, factor or variable. In this case, it was uh, their academic success, and it it, um, it it created a model that only included uh, the ones that that um that had the highest relationship uh, to your outcome. So when I did this, uh, a factor called quality of life came up to the top. Uh, and th this was measured by the factor or, or by a question uh, that said, how do you feel about your life uh, at present? And the response choices range from, um, uh, I feel great about my life to, uh, or, or, or I feel very happy about my life, they use the term happy, uh, to, uh, I don't feel good about my life at all. So young black males who felt the best about their lives, they were the ones that were doing the best in school. The second highest factor, the, the second highest variable that came up uh, was something called tired in the morning. Tired in the morning was, was measured by a question that was given to the students who participated that said, how often do you feel extremely tired when you go to school in the morning? And the re response choices was rarely, if ever, uh, down to almost every day. So the black males who felt tired in the morning almost every day, uh, they were the ones who were uh, the most likely to be doing bad in school. Uh, and so this one kind of um, uh, confused me a little bit uh, because I just wasn't expecting it to be, uh, you know, to, to have quite that high of a relationship to their academic success. Uh, and then I, I talked to a colleague of mine and it didn't surprise him at all. And in fact, he was working on a study looking at the relationship between sleep deprivation uh, and the misdiagnosis of ADHD among black males. So when I asked him to tell me more about that, uh, you know, he, he you know, kind of put it in terms that, uh, that he and I could relate to. He, he uh, described it as, you know, how do you feel when you go to a conference and you stay up uh, very late the night before chatting it up at the hotel bar with your colleagues and you don't get a lot of sleep that night. And then uh, that next morning you go to a session. Uh, how do you typically behave? And so I had to concede that, uh, yeah, I have to fidget a little bit more, probably check my smartphone more often. I might need a psychoactive stimulant like uh, Ritalin or coffee just kidding about the riddling, uh, but you get the point. But then also in the essays, uh, I read something from uh, a, a young man who participated in the contest. Uh, and in his essay, he wrote, I think sometimes we don't get enough sleep and can't stay up during class, which affects how much information you get from the teacher. From that, you don't take very good notes. Then you study bad notes and have the wrong information now you take a test and get a bad grade, and that gives people further reason to believe that we are dumb and don't know anything. So a kid named Brian Bunkley, an uh, eighth grader, uh, wrote this. Now, in, in, in context with that research finding, uh, that was illuminating uh, because he not only helped me to understand the relationship between sleep deprivation and not doing well in school in very eloquent terms, but he also, connected to an entire system where he's sensitive to the fact that people are looking for reasons to believe that we are dumb. He didn't say he is dumb. He said we are dumb and don't know anything. Uh, so I thought that was very profound. So the, the report that I wrote in 2008, where I used IPOM's data, IPOM's data uh, along with a lot of other data sets, uh, I also dispersed the comments from the students all throughout the report uh, because I, I felt like their comments helped to illustrate what was going on in a way that the, that the data couldn't. Now, after I wrote this report, I ended up talking to a lot of different people who are interested in the findings uh, to um, 
uh, try to codify it into uh, more policy and practice decisions uh, to create be better systems for uh, young black males. Um, now, one of the things that I bumped up against in, um, in the process of talking to all of these people is I found that there was a lot of people who just wasn't buying into a lot of my findings. Uh, they wasn't buying into uh, either the research findings or what these kids were saying because they had been so conditioned to believe that Black people, particularly Black males, uh, were uh, so far gone that no reasonable solution would work. You know, a reasonable solution would be something like uh, um, dealing with health, health behaviors and habits uh, are, are dealing with some of the structural conditions that uh, make, make, make it uh, create some disparities in, uh, in, in, in their diets and things like that. Uh, and there was a lot of other um, implications in that. But the, the people that I was talking to, they seem to be thinking more along the lines of uh, extreme, like we need to completely disband public schools. Uh, teacher unions are the problems. Like it was just, you know, all these types of things. Um, and when I started to really query them about, um, you know, why do you believe all these things? Uh, I, I, I started hearing a lot of uh, similar themes like um, single parent households, um, one in four is going to prison or won't graduate or 50% won't graduate. So all of these types of things. So that's when I started to look deeper into some of the things that I've been hearing. Uh, now I'm gonna play for you uh, six minutes of an interview that I did for the BBC where I talked about one of the things that I heard quite a bit, and that's the idea that there are more black men in prison than college. Um, I did an analysis of both IPM's data uh, as well as data from the National Center for Educational Statistics and looking at, at uh, Bureau of Justice statistics. And I found that um, you know, by the time I looked at it in 2013, uh, there was about 600,000 more black men in college than prison. Um, now there's um, even more than that, about 800,000 more black men in, in college than prison. Uh, but every, everyone was kind of locked into this notion of there are more black men in prison than college. So I'm gonna, I'm gonna play six minutes of an interview on BBC. Then I wanna uh, I'll talk about this in context uh, to research bias and talk about a, a Du Boisian framework for uh, analyzing research. Hello, this is more or less on the BBC World Service. I'm Ruth Alexander, and this week we're looking at this claim. We still have more work to do. We have more work to do when more young black men languish in prison than attend colleges and universities across America. That was Barack Obama in 2007, before he became US president, making the claim that there are more black men in prison than in college in the US. Wesley Stevenson's here with me, and Wesley, Barack Obama isn't the only person to have seen the power in this statement. No, it's something you'll hear repeated again and again. <clears throat> My last time hearing it was uh, last Friday at Howard University's uh, Charter Day program and it was our keynote speaker. What was your instant reaction when you heard those words come out of his mouth? It, it wasn't necessarily a visceral reaction, more humor, you know, uh, here we go again. This is Ivory Tolson. He's an associate professor of psychology at Howard University in Washington, DC. And he's recently written about the use of this claim. It was a statistic that he himself has even used when he wrote a paper back in 2008, pushing for better educational success for black young men but he's realized that while making this claim is good for rallying activists, it's also having a negative effect on young black men in the US. When they heard things like there are more black men in prison than in college, it did something different to their spirit. These are young black males who are still trying to figure it out. They know that they could do better. They wanna do better. And so I started to feel like a lot of the statistics that we were using was more of a burden to them than the motivation. 
It was this that made him begin to wonder. Was this fact that there are more black men in prison than in college in the US actually true? He started looking at the numbers and found an interesting trend. I found that year after year, we were gaining lots of black males in college. Uh, however, the prison population had remained relatively static and the college population among young black males is about 600,000 more than the prison population. Uh, yet that myth is still very pervasive out there. So it isn't true now, but what about when it was first published? The original claim came from a report by the campaign group, the Justice Policy Institute. It was based on figures from the year 2000. So Ivory re-examined the numbers that we use and compared them to the current numbers of black men in college, and something struck him as odd. What I found strange was how did we get a 108% jump in the black male college population? It didn't seem feasible for us to achieve that in only 10 years. I looked at the colleges that had significant black male populations today, but it had either no or very little black males reported 10 years ago. And what I found was a lot of historically black universities was on that list. My own alma mater was on that list and I was enrolled as a graduate student there at the time. And so what appears to have happened was back when they pulled the numbers, there were just a lot of colleges that weren't reporting their numbers. So there were many black college students missing from the numbers that the Justice Policy Institute used back in the early 2000s. And even Ivory himself was missing from the college attendance figures. It's not often that we actually get to meet a missing statistic. <laughs> no. I mean, he says that when he looked at the census data from the early 2000s, this shows there were more black men in college than in prison at that time. So not only is it not true now, this claim, it probably wasn't true when it was first made 13 years ago. And yet, in the face of the truth, this zombie statistic refuses to die. Now, you can see that when it was first written in the Justice Policy Institute report, it must have seemed like a really simple and grabby comparison. And it's one that they've stood by in the past, but how do they feel about it now? I asked one of their senior researchers, Melissa Neal. I'm not sure if our researchers were, were really thinking about the number of colleges reporting. That was not a limitation that we clearly uh, expressed in our write-up. So, uh, you know, I recognize that we probably should have done a better job of that. We definitely hate to see that people have misconstrued our intent, but our primary goal was to draw attention to disparities in both education and the criminal justice system. And so one of the best ways to do that is to inform people. Although in this case, it seems they were informing people without the full facts. Yes, but she did actually raise another very good point. African-American males are still disproportionately channeled into the criminal justice system, and they are still not able to have the same educational success as their peers of other ethnicities. So there may be more black men in college than in prison, but this isn't really the end of the story. Black men still lag behind their white counterparts in the number attending top-rated universities, and they lag behind them in terms of the numbers who graduate. And in prison, black people account for 40% of the prison population, but only 12% of the US population. So there's still work to be done. Thanks, Wes. And stay there because... Okay, so the idea that there are more black men in prison than college is something that um, really created a lot of... Um, it, it, it created a lot of conversations for over a decade and even to this day. Um, and me debunking that myth, me uh, um, coming out with multiple articles that got attention, uh, not only from the BBC, but from NPR. And, uh, and it caused the original authors to have to um, talk about it. Um, it made me really, think a lot about the psyche of people who hold on to negative statistics, even when there's evidence to the contrary. And then it, it 
made me kind of do a little soul searching because I also use that stat, there are more Black men in prison than college. In fact, in the same report that I told you all about, the 2008 Breaking Barriers report, uh, I cited that there were more Black men in prison than college, and I cited the Justice Policy Institute only to only five years later uh, um, write something that they um, you know disputed initially, and then they backed down uh, after you know a few conversations like the one that we had on, had with the BBC. Um, but I was also struck by the number of Black activists that uh, almost um, acted like I was on the wrong side of the struggle because I debunked this myth. Now, if you really care about Black people, if you really care about Black males, something that is contrary to something as negative as that uh, should be a reason to celebrate. And if you also know a lot about what the problems are and what the things that we need to work on, then you wouldn't use such a simple statistic to either advocate or to pull back. So I had to think a lot about why people were so susceptible to taking in negative information about Black people and taking it on as gospel. Uh, and so between the time that uh, I was writing uh, this myth-busting stuff like the, um, the article on that, uh, I started to think more about the, um, a, a framework to help us to think through, um, you know, what is good stats? If we have BS, if I'm saying there's BS out there and we can't use the BS, then what does, you know, what does GS look like? What does good stats look like? What does good data look like? And so in doing that, I started to think about how W.B. Du Bois um, conceptualized his work. Uh, and in the book that I published last year, uh, No BS, and I have to say that um, Rob got through that long title like he had been uh, saying it for years. Uh, most of the time people stumble on that title, but Rob uh, read the title like it was his book. Uh, very impressed. So in this book, I started off by talking more about um, why we may miss the mark when it comes to doing research on Black people, Black people in particular. Um, now, there are, there are three things that we should keep in mind when it comes to analyzing. I know a lot of people who are participating in this right now. Uh, you have your own line of research, and you have a population that you are studying. Uh, and we have different motivations for selecting the topics that we select. Uh, but most of the time, and, and the, uh, the, the humanistic uh, person in me, the, the, the altruistic person in me, uh, likes to believe that um, the vast majority of you all selected the topic because you care about uh, a, a particular um, segment of the population. You think that uh, society could work better for a particular segment of the population. Um, now, one of, the, one of the reasons why we have a lot of BS circulating out there is because we use a lot of what I call objectivist research. Um, and you can call it objective research also, but it's, a, it's research that is conducted under the philosophy that if you are too personally connected to the subject, then you will have biases that will interfere with you conducting the research as best you can. It's a, it's a philosophy that makes us, be, us believe that um, a, a white scientist may do better research on the black population than a black scientist because the black scientist may have subjective biases. Um, that is fundamentally wrong. Uh, and it's a dangerous way of thinking for a number of different reasons. Uh, now, connecting this back to Du Bois, um, when Du Bois did, the, the, did his research that was connected to his book, The Philadelphia Negro, which he published in the very early 1900s, 
he used the first version of what we today would consider GIS mapping. Uh, he geocoded a map, uh, went door to door. He also did what we would consider now as community participatory research. Uh, he actually moved to the neighborhood of the people he was conducting research on so that he could immerse himself in their experience. And so when he interpreted his findings, he would be able to interpret it from their lens, not the lens of other. Um, he also did what we would call uh, asset-based research, uh, because when you are in a community like that, uh, you are bound to see both these strengths, assets, as well as uh, the, the room for growth. Uh, so all of these things help to inform uh, his way of approaching research. Uh, and he battled during that time with people who considered his research to be too subjective. But when we think about the decades and over a century of research that has used mostly objective research, we see that those populations that have fewer people in the academy, including poor people and African-Americans, we see that the research output isn't necessarily benefiting us that much. And so we have to think about a different way of doing research. Uh, so in this model, we start with good data. Good data is, is data that's open to a range of interpretations. Um, uh, and then we go to thoughtful analysis. I already talked about the power of within group analysis as, a, as, as opposed to uh, between group analysis, thoughtful comparisons, growth indicators, strength-based and unbiased. And then the third, and I think this is the most important, is compassion and understanding. Compassion and understanding is understanding that from the standpoint of a holistic, humanistic, uh, it's understanding the issues as if they were your own problems. And you can do this vicariously through interviewing people uh, who would likely be a, a product of the numbers that you are generating. Uh, reading articles uh, that are outside of academia, but looking at news articles where they've been interviewed, looking at YouTube videos, looking at documentaries. So all of these things helps, helps us to develop this compassion and understanding. So I wanna conclude my remarks and open it up to questions uh, with um, uh, this notion. A lot of times when we generate data, we use it to understand people better. But really, we should be doing the opposite. We should use people to understand our data better. So for instance, when I derived of the data that Black males who are doing better in school uh, sleep more at night, I can't use that to think that I know more about these young Black males. It wasn't until I read Brian Bunkley's essay and he broke it down for me in a way that helped me to really understand it in its full context. So understand that our numbers are always incomplete and without context, and we need to treat them as such. We only get context for the numbers when we humanize the data, uh, when we think of data as people. Um, when we separate data from people, we can use it to objectify people and we can use it to oppress people. When we humanize the data, then we can really use it in a way that helps to uplift people as opposed to objectifying them. So I wanna stop there and open it up for a larger Q&A. Thank you, Okay, I see a raised hand. Uh, is that um, Jamag? Jamag? Yeah. Uh, yeah. Um, I just wanted to follow up on the initial premise uh, of your of your talk, talking about the backlash that you got about um, kind of correcting um, those statistics about the number of black men in prison versus those in college. Mm -hmm. And maybe this detracts from a larger conversation, but kind of thinking about 
what what work false statistics do, not only in terms of working against black people, but in a way that allows white people to feel more comfortable engaging in diversity issues. And I and I wonder if you could speak on if there is some comfort in relying on bad statistics or relying on negative narratives to motivate black people or to motivate white people to care enough about black people, if that makes sense. Yeah, it makes a lot of sense. Um, and that was the reasons why people use it, right? They, they wanted to amplify the problem. They wanted to sound the alarm. Uh, they wanted people to wake up. Um, I would say that anytime you, you see the most pro-Black activists and the most racist white people saying the same thing, um, you should step back a bit because <laughs> they were both saying it. You know, they, they, they just had different reasons for saying it. Uh, one group was saying that because they wanted to promote the idea that Black men were inherently uh, more prone to criminal behavior. And the other one uh, wanted to, was saying that because they wanted to uh, amplify uh, the idea that there's a prison industrial complex uh, and there are, are um, disparities, that there's, there's injustices in the criminal justice system. And, and those, those injustices are, are things I'm very sensitive of. Uh, I, I worked in the prison um, for a year uh, and you know, seeing all of those young black men behind bars, um, uh, seeing you know, Unicor, which was a prison thing, taking on jobs at Unicor, making 23 cents an hour. Um, and, and just kind of seeing there that you can actually make more money off of less violent inmates because the more violent inmates you spend more money on because there's such a security risk. Um, so luck, um, our, you look frozen. Uh, am I still, you all still hear me? I still hear you, but you're okay. a little delayed. Okay, I think there was a, a network interruption. Yeah, so, so, so you have, so, so you have, so, so I'm, I'm, I'm keenly aware of these injustices. Um, you know, also, you know, conspiracy with intent to distribute crack cocaine. Um, you know, all of these things need to be addressed in society. One of the things I noticed is that the people who was yelling that statistic didn't really know the issues that well. And so they were using the statistic as this quick way of trying to rally up people, but the ones that were really doing the work, they knew the issues well beyond that stat. Um, so, you know, there's a lot of things we need to try to think about. I think another um, problem with that particular statistic is it conflated college bound, are, are, are black males who weren't getting what they needed to go to college and black males who are at risk for going in the criminal justice system. And so it created systems where we had this erroneous belief that if we could just keep black males from going to jail, that we would increase the college population. So forget about physics and calculus and higher level courses, forget about ACT prep in their schools, uh, for, for, forget about the college tours and all that kind of stuff. They are all at risk for going in the criminal justice system. So at the end of the day, we've received subpar treatment and care with, with a lack of nuance, the, the nuance that it needs to really be effective because we have these soundbite stats. Uh, so you know, getting rid of it opens up an opportunity for us to think deeper about the issues that actually do exist. All right, it looks like uh, we have a question from Miriam. Miriam, if you want to ask your question. Sure. Um, can you hear me? Uh, you're very quiet. Okay, maybe maybe you should ask my question, Stacy, since I'm not coming through clearly. Okay, I'll read your question for you. Um, she writes, I am thinking about Bob uh, Humer's work at looking at health outcomes for relatively well-placed African-American women and seeing the gap from white women as an indicator of systemic racism. Um, so it's, what is, 
you can see the question in the chat there as well. Okay. Yeah. So if I'm if I'm understanding the um, the question or comment, uh, it it um I'm I'm taking it as uh, there's some value of doing comparisons because it helps us to understand systemic racism, and I agree with that wholeheartedly. Um, I in fact I think that's the only reason to do comparisons really. It's to understand systemic racism, just like the only good reason to compare women and men. You know, let's let's take for instance uh, income. You know, we know that there is, um, you know, there's this pay gap between men and women for doing the same job. The only reason to look at that pay gap is to understand the impact of sexism in the workplace. It, it doesn't help us to to, to understand what women uh, should be doing. And if you use that information and say women need to work harder, then that would be sexist in and of itself. Um, we typically don't do the same thing for black people though. We'll look at a gap between white people and black people and not talk about systemic racism, but talk about the things that black people should be doing. Um, if we want to understand what black people should be doing, there's no reason to look at what white people are doing because they are doing it from the from the standpoint of privilege from from white privilege a privilege that we don't have so when you want to understand how black people could do better you look at black people who are doing better you so so instead of your point of comparison being a, a completely different race that has a completely different lived experience your point of comparison is the is a segment of that population that has created these innovative ways of dealing with a bad situation. And that's what we need to understand more. Um, so so, so we, we have to be very intentional and very um, thoughtful about how we use between group analysis and within group analysis and the reasons for doing either one. Looks like there's another question from June. Uh, June, you want to ask your question? All right. Yes, I think it's working. Can you hear me? Yes, very well. So I've been doing some some work on women in corporate America, and I should add, I'm in the law school, so I don't do anything empirical. I just consume empirical work. And one of the things we're seeing, and I'm I'm curious if you have a perspective on how it fits in is um, a lot of discussion about uh, zero-sum thinking. You know, so that the more you focus on, uh, and what we're seeing this in corporate America, finance, tech, is the more competitive the environment, the more winners think they're there because of justification, and the more they see uh, the ability to increase diversity as, um, uh, you know, uh, somebody else wins, I lose. Uh, and, and there are some empirical studies that indicate the more competitive the environments, also the more the racist and sexist and stereotypical kinds of things. Mm -hmm. I was reading some other things that a lot of the discussion on white privilege also tends to use a zero sum framework and it's something you must surrender privilege right. for there to be an advance. Mm -hmm. And I'm struggling in the context of the work I'm doing on gender on how to reframe it certainly one of the you know one of the things i've seen when looking at when does uh when do wage gaps narrow so for african americans the best decades were world war ii and then um 1965 to 1975 but primarily in the south and when you look in, in at what's happening you're having something where there are dynamic forces that are opening things up it's not just opening things up for African Americans, they're opening things up more generally. And some of the studies, for example, in the 40s show that families that, for example, got hired at the auto plants, that African Americans who got union jobs kept them when the troops came home and their kids went to college. But the people who didn't advance during the time periods when the windows opened, uh, tended, their children did worse. 
And what I've been wondering about is, you know, and, and this goes to Derek Bell's interest convergence ideas as well, ways of changing the narrative to win-win instead of zero-sum advances. And it seems to me some of what, you, I love what you presented and um, love the perspectives that it's not necessarily dismantling, you know, the entire entrenched system of racism, but there are places where there are real advances being made. Yeah. Can we explain that in ways that then are transformative instead of threatening? Yeah. So that's, a, uh, you know, I, I love the perspective you bring to this. Yeah, yeah, and and um, you know, you have a unique perspective embedded in that, and um, and I, you know, I think the, the the overall thing is is um, we all have to 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 challenge the way that we have been normalized to, or, or the way that we have been taught to think about what norms are, you know. So um, there was a a study that I saw that that talked about. Uh, property values being depressed in predominantly black neighborhoods. And so they looked at the values in the predominantly white neighborhoods and the values in the predominantly black neighborhoods. And they looked at the gap between the two. And what they surmised is that um, black property values were undervalued. Now, if you really think about it, and you know, I'm thinking about you know DC and New York and some of these places with all these inflated property values, is it really black neighborhoods that are undervalued or is it white neighborhoods that's overvalued? Because if we think about what would be good for overall society overall, it wouldn't be for uh, these you know, relatively few black homes to have an inflated value to where working class black people couldn't be able to move in those neighborhoods what would benefit society better is if those inflated values in the white neighborhoods came down to a more reasonable level. But because we've normalized whiteness, we've looked at their values as being what everyone else should aspire to, when maybe society over, overall should be, you know, should, should be aspiring mm -hmm. down. And, and there's, there's examples like that all through, all throughout. Yeah. Um, you know, when, when we are using you know, white as a norm reference group, uh, when when we are um, looking only at types of assessments that tend to favor um, uh, uh, these types of, you know, uh, uh, white populations. Uh, so the normalization of, of, of whiteness uh, is an issue. And, and we, we may find that if we were able to be more open and, and, um, and inclusive in our norms, we may find norms in other populations outside of white that would be to a better benefit of society. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I like that. Any other questions? And you can just take yourself off mute and talk, or you can raise your hand, however you want to be recognized. Hi, um, this is Hannah. And I was thinking a lot during your talk about the conversation that you were having about how statistics can be a burden rather than a motivation. Mm -hmm. And that's been sitting in my mind a little bit. And to give a little bit of context, I'm a, real, I'm a new PhD student, but my interests lie in, in criminal justice and particularly in um, the sentencing of violent crimes. And so I'm. this is already a particularly um, oppressive, particularly difficult, particularly stereotyped population that frankly people don't want to deal with um, and that I have some relationship with, but I'm trying to think about how can we, um, I'm curious to hear you say more about how we can speak to um, truly oppressive structures, truly um, dehumanizing circumstances where people have strength and where people have community and where people have bonds and relationship and mentorship, but speak to that reality and not add, continue to add to this burden of, you know, what, what we think the statistics ought to be. How can we talk about this in terms of motivation rather than burden, particularly when looking at um, really difficult circumstances? Yeah, that's a that's a very good question, and it it starts with 
understanding the population, understanding the community. Um, I remember doing an a interview in my hometown of Baton Rouge, Louisiana, and uh, the, um, the reporter uh, wanted to do a positive story about, about a Black person from, um, from Baton Rouge, from, particularly from my neighborhood, uh, because she said that she was tired of, of, um, of talking about all the, the bad things. Uh, and and so I, I sat through the interview and and um and you know talked to her quite a bit and she um she she asked me about you know growing up in a neighborhood that was um you know so you know that had so much crime uh, and I told her that I didn't really perceive a lot of crime you know growing up. And that, um, and she was really looking at my zip code, and I and I was trying to explain to her that there were places in my zip code that I would never go to, but I was insulated from it. So even though we shared the same zip code, I didn't feel like I grew up with all of this crime, uh, and it didn't really seem like that was resonating. With, like she didn't really seem to get it. And then she asked me, I, and I told her that that um, you know, when I was in high school, I had friends that. That, uh, that sold drugs. And the larger point I was making was that back then I didn't see that as the worst thing that they could be doing, something bad, but I didn't see it as the worst thing they could be doing. But then fast forward, when I worked in prison, I saw people selling drugs with longer sentences than child molesters, which I did think was a horrible thing. And so I was really illustrating uh, some um, you know, paradoxes in the criminal justice system. And then, so she asked me if any of my friends still sell drugs. And I said, you know, no, I'm 35. You know, that was, I was 35 at the time. And I was like, like, you know, we don't really sell drugs that late. Like, like in my neighborhood, that's kind of like this young thing that you do. Um, you know, you do this when you're a stupid kid. And, you know, by the time you're like 18, you've either, you're either doing something else or you've, You've you've learned the hard way, you know. You've gotten shot, or you've uh, you've gone to jail, but no, you you don't still sell drugs. You don't sell drugs continuously from teenagers to thirty five. So I told her that, and then when she wrote the article, she she put while some of his friends still sell drugs. <laughs> so I say that to say that we take these numbers, you know, like like she was using this data. And she just felt like she knew my neighborhood better than I did. And there was nothing I can tell her to convince her that it's not that bad. Like, you know, my children go to that same neighborhood to spend time with their grandmother every single summer. I can leave them there for weeks and not worry about them. But in her mind, that zip code was this dangerous place. So, when we do research, we, you know, we research problems more than we research solutions. And, and, and while we're researching, pro while we're researching these problems, you know, we're getting this data point and that data point, and this data point. Uh, and it could be, you know, like we could be, we could study a community that has 10,000 people in it and 1,000 has this problem. And yeah, that's 1,000 too many, but you have a full 9,000 that don't have the same problem. And, and instead of talking to the nine problem, like, 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 you know, what's happening in this area? You know, how are you avoiding this? Um, how do you feel about the ones that do have this problem? And, you know, this could be a problem, like, you know, they got AIDS or they've gone to jail or, you know, anything. But you could have a, a good majority of people that don't have the same problem. And we refuse to look inside that neighborhood and really contextualize it in a way that humanizes them. Because at the end of the day, we're studying numbers, but these are people's lived experience. And there are some people who are suffering in this experience, but there are some people who are managing it. And a lot of times you'll find people who enjoy, enjoy that, you know, like, like I, I remember meeting a, a young woman from a very rural area. Uh, Cause I, I spoke there um, and, 
she said that she had only left that area one time uh, to go to uh, Dallas was the nearest big city, which was three hours away. She went to Dallas one time, hasn't been uh, away from there since, and didn't want, didn't, had no desire to, to go anywhere else. And, you know, me with my cosmopolitan lens, I'm just thinking, you know, rural area, you got uh, brain drain, you don't have adequate health care, you know, like all these types of things. It's hard for me to imagine someone does not want to live there uh, or don't want to leave there. So if I'm a researcher doing research on this population, yes, I'm going to do bias type research that really doesn't capture their experience. So, you know, I, I just go back to the original um, comment or point. You have to have a good conversation with the people who are most affected by what you're studying to really understand in a way that gives it the proper context and nuance that it needs. Can I ask a question? Sure. Okay. Kind of following up on Hannah's question, um, I think the the stories that you've told about the the problem with statistics and not seeing within statistics, you can kind of see that happening at a meta level too, though. Like think about police officers who, because of structural racism, are much, I mean, they're much more likely to be policing particular neighborhoods. They're much more likely, I mean, they're told that this thing is a bad thing we care about, like crime, like drugs, mm -hmm. you know, and there's all this other stuff that's happening over here in the suburbs that we don't care about. Um, and as a consequence of structural racism, what they're actually observing is um, perhaps more people of color engaging in crime than, uh, than is represented in the population. So for in that kind of case, do you think the statistic could actually help to, you know, counter the fact that they're sort of funneled into particular issues and funneled into focus on particular things? I just wondered. Yeah, uh, that, that's a, a, a great observation and it, it needs a lot more, it needs a lot more attention. Um, what I see, you know, written about police, policing and their relationship to the communities, um, it, it seems to be woefully incomplete and, um, you know, doesn't, doesn't capture, capture the complexities uh, like, like, it, like it needs to. Um, you know, the training of police officers, I think is completely out of whack. Um, they, similar to what you're saying, they are trained to look for problems. Um, giving them, you know, positive statistics, uh, I think, you know, it, it, it could help. Um, I think it would help more if they was able to interact and interface with the community in ways that doesn't involve policing. Sometimes there's some clumsy attempts to do that, you know, setting up a basketball game and things like that, but um, not in a way that is very, very meaningful. Um, but, you know, overall, the academic community, I don't think has a very good grasp on all the dynamics at, at play when it comes to police in Black communities. Uh, and, you know, I may offend some people when I say this, but when I hear academics like me put their self in the middle of this struggle between police and the black community. And the first thing we say is, you know, this could be my child, this could be my child. But the children that are really being affected by this, they're honestly not growing up with the same experiences as the children of academics. There are children that have to see police every single day. Like when they leave their house, they, they are seeing police and the, um, the way that people in a, lot, in a lot of these poor neighborhoods, the way that they interact with police is just different than what the narrative even looks like. You know, like, like, like sometimes, you know, like, like it's, it's this combination of, you know, sometimes it's overly abusive with police officers, like they're abusing the community. And then at other times you'll see like banter 
you know, and 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 you you'll see these these really interesting survival mechanisms that happen among the people who have to be policed every single day. And so uh, until we really do a, a deep dive ethnographic analysis and include the people who are the most vulnerable, and, and, the, and it is a, a, a segment of the Black community. It's not the entire Black community. And again, my Black colleagues, they, they get really upset when I say that. But when you look at the people like George Floyd and the and you know the people who are killed by police officers. Now I'm not talking about the ones that's killed by non-police officers like Ahmaud Arbery and Trayvon Martin. I'm talking about the ones that's killed by police officers. Typically their lives and experiences are different than a lot of the black academics that's talking on their behalf. So how difficult would it be for us to invite them into our research? I think we should. I think we should invite people who didn't go to college, who lived in those communities, those neighborhoods all of their life, who interface with police officers every single day and have adapted some interesting strategies of survival that they really shouldn't have to until we invite them into the research process we're always going to get this superficial type of analysis that really revolves around, you know, black upper middle class. I, I hate to do it, but we gotta we gotta cut it off on the note. Okay. Um, thank you so much for your presentation and the discussion today. Thank you. I just wanted to say, yeah, I, I see your point, and I also see on your from your response how, you know, my focus on the white police officers is once again sort of decentering the community. So I appreciate that that response. So, yeah, that's a, that's a good point too. Yeah, yeah just just to, just to add on another monkey wrench. Um, black people are not underrepresented in the police the, the police department in most cities, now, that varies by city, but in most cities, if you look at the population of black people and the population of black people within the police department, they're not underrepresented in terms of a sheer demographic. So the problems have something is deeper than the diversity, is training, is culture, is the blue code, is police unions, it's a lot of things we need to look at. And, and, and there's also a lot of problems that's beyond the power of police like the prosecutors right and the right and the you know the drug laws and things like that i mean yeah so they they're slotted into a structure yeah yeah but we'll talk offline rob said we gotta go okay yeah no thanks very much All right, thank you <laughs>